Good morning. Good morning. Well, let me just tell you, first of all, it's 12 o'clock. <laughs> Secondly, I have been attacked by Satan nonstop in preparing this message. It does not surprise me that it's now 12 o'clock, because what happens at 12 o'clock, <gasps> the stomach starts growling. You think, oh, I wonder if chilies or red lobster, your mind starts straying. And so I have a question for you, being that it's 12 o'clock. Do you want to hear this message that the Lord has for you, yes. or are you ready to go to lunch? Yes. So you want to hear it? Yes. Because I went through a lot to get it on paper. <laughs> I don't mind. But when the Lord gives, he gives for the purpose of the body to be edified and to be raised up. If you don't give this message, the enemy wins. The enemy wins. So we're going to pray right now because the enemy is going to come against, I have no doubt. With what I told you. Your stomach will start rumbling. You'll start thinking about what you want for lunch. You'll start thinking, how long is she going to go? So we want to bind that. Please close your eyes. Heavenly Father, I just bring before this message to you. Lord, I ask that you get across exactly what needs to be gotten across, that you give the revelation that needs to be given. Yeah. Satan, I bind you in the name of Jesus yeah. from yeah. hindering this message from getting forth. I ask that I, eyes and yeah. ears and spirits would be awakened to yes, the things of Lord. you, Father, so that yes, Father. you would minister in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 It was a horrific scene. An attack on innocence. A wealthy plantation had been violated. The livestock had been stolen. The other animals that had survived the attack were killed in the fire. Then a building had collapsed on all of the owner's children killing them. It wasn't long after that the owner fell severely ill. He couldn't even find consolation in his dearest of friends as they, in their so-called wisdom, accused him of bringing such calamity upon himself through some kind of hidden sin. He lost nearly everything, and yet he never turned his back on God. In fact, he never even sinned. How about you? How do you react, or how have you reacted in the midst of calamity? How are we supposed to deal with the worst that this life offers? All we need to do is listen to the news, and it becomes quite clear how people are dealing with their pain. Drugs, murder, sex, anger, rage, alcoholism, lying, stealing, and the list goes on and on and on. You see, people act out of their hurt. They act out of their pain. And that is the catalyst that the enemy uses to work in and through people. The only true healing comes from our Heavenly Father. But because people have turned away from God and they have tried to make this into a godless nation, we're dealing with a whole lot of people acting out in various ways to try and cover and escape from the pain that calamity brings. But you, you're of a different realm. You as believers abide in another set of standards. You see, when Jesus died on the cross for you and you accepted him into your heart according to Romans 10, 9 and 10, you left your rights at the cross. Chomp on that one. Did you get it? You left your rights willingly at the cross. You were purchased. You were bought with Christ's blood. You're no longer your own. You, the me part, no longer have rights. And that is a hard pill to swallow. But you were bought. A price was paid. And the end result was a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. However, it still rains on the just and the unjust. What happens when things don't go the way we planned? Or when God doesn't do things the way we expected him to do them? What happens when somebody close to us dies? When it appears that we don't have enough finances to pay the bills? When we mess up and the consequences are devastating? How do we deal with the trials and tribulations that we encounter in this life? First, let me make it very clear that 
Everyone deals with calamities. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 8 sums it up in a way that I couldn't. To everything there's a season and a time for every matter or purpose under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. That makes one thing very, very clear. We will all go through different seasons in our lives. In the past three years, Mark and I have gone through one calamity after another. Two pregnancies, one resulting in death at 28 weeks gestation, the other, Jackson McAllister Howell, coming doing? early, eight <laughs> weeks premature, in the NICU for eight weeks, uprooting ourselves and living at Ronald McDonald, thank God for them, in St. Pete that whole time. Mark's job eliminated, our sole income gone, months with no medical insurance with a preemie, and the loss of our home. In other words, what I just said, it's been one thing after another. It's been a tough few years, and let me just say right now, oh, I have had my moments. How do we not only survive calamity when it comes our way, especially when we feel like the waves are tossing us to and fro and having their way with us, but how do we thrive and live life the way God intended us to do? And God, God intended us to. What steps can we put into place to deal with the calamities of this life? Now, none of you have faced calamity, right? <laughs> the wealthy plantation owner that I talk about? Well, that was my modern version of Job. So let's take a look at how Job handled calamity. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to Job. First chapter, verse, verses 13 through 21. Job 1, 13 through 21. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them when the Sabians raided them and took them away. Indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Oh, but while he was still speaking, another also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels, and took them away. Yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. But while he was still speaking, <coughs> another also came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and suddenly a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are dead. I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. He said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all of this, Job did not sin, nor charge God with wrongdoing. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but that was heavy. I would have passed out. One thing after another, after another, after another. But notice what the scripture says here. He fell to the ground, and he worshipped the first step I want to talk about, let's see if it will do it. I'll try. Not created you last night. You work. Mm -hmm. 
today is worship. Now, it sounds like a pretty word and a nonchalant piece of advice, but it's so much more than that. Worship has played a pivotal role in my own time of calamities. Years ago, I remember this instance where I was discouraged and depressed and racking my brain for someone to call to help me out of that pit when the Lord spoke to me and told me I did not need to call anyone. What I needed to do was to worship him. And through that worship, it would lift me out of that pit. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. John 4, 24. There is a supernatural healing component within worship that touches our spirits. It is one of the most intimate parts in our relationship with God. It is deep, it is spiritual, it is supernatural, and it's a choice. It's communing spirit to spirit with our God. In 2011, when we lost Julia, the song, You Are Still Holy, ministered to me in ways that I cannot even explain to you. The words were the cry of my heart. And we sang them today, but I'd, I'd like to read them. Holy, you are still holy, even when the darkness surrounds my life. Sovereign, you are still sovereign, even when confusion has blinded my eyes. Lord, I don't deserve your kind affection when your unbelief has kept me from your touch. I want my life to be a pure reflection of your love. And so I come into your chambers, and I dance at your feet, Lord. You are my Savior, and I am at your mercy. All that has been given in my life up to now, it belongs to you. You are still holy. Holy, you are still holy, even though I don't understand your ways. Sovereign, you will be sovereign, even when my circumstances don't change. Lord, I don't deserve your tender patience when my unbelief has kept me from your truth. You know, unbelief is dealing with trust. I want my life to be a sweet devotion to you. That was my cry. That was my heart while I was going through that calamity. And after everything was over, I remember coming to church and I couldn't even move my lips, open my mouth. I, I could not worship. I just couldn't do it. There was such pain and such loss. I didn't even know how to worship in that moment. So what I'm telling you is that there's not a set guideline of how to worship. It may be that you simply simply sit and absorb the atmosphere of worship. It may be that you have one song like I did that speaks to you so deeply that you play it over and over again. Or it may be that you put on a playlist of worship and you sing your heart out. Worship is different for each one of us, but it's a crucial element in dealing with life's calamities. Yeah. Our spirit man is able to commune and get in touch with his spirit. It won't do it, will it? Here's the main point. When you worship, your eyes are taken off of the me and placed on the I am. Step two. Attitude. Your attitude determines a lot in the midst of calamity. Your mindset is one of the most vulnerable aspects when you're going through a calamity. And there are a few things that contribute to your attitude and your mindset. Next PowerPoint. Decreeing and declaring. Now, I better not hear any one of you except for our visitors say that you, you know, you have not, we, we've talked about decreeing and declaring how many times? So you better know, when I'm talking about decreeing and declaring, what we're talking about. I read a short article on decreeing and declaring by Yvonne Perkins that summed up the point beautifully, and I'm going to share that, some of her article. 
According to the dictionary, decree is defined as a rule of law issued by a head of state. In biblical times, the king had the authority to make the decree. The decree was a written document and would be very specific and clear about that subject matter. It was law and had to be carried out according to the king's wishes, and failure to obey the decree was punishable by law. Now let's look at the definition for declare. Declare to make known or state clearly, especially in explicit or formal terms, to declare one's position in a controversy, to announce officially, proclaim, to declare a state of emergency, to declare a winner, to state emphatically, to show, reveal, or manifest the heavens, declare the glory of God. Job 22:28. Thou shalt also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee, and the light shall shine upon thy ways. The person making the decree must be in a position of power and authority to do so. You have the power <coughs> and authority to make decrees and expect that they will be carried out. Amen. You shall decree. The power is yours. State your case. Write it down. The conditions regarding your home, family, ministry, and all that concern you. The words that you speak will be established. Amen. That means it will be manifested, revealed, Amen. shown to be true as you have spoken it. Amen. The light shall shine upon thy way, which means there will be enlightenment in your mind. Who gives enlightenment? Revelation. And spirit that will cause you to see clearly the path that is laid before you. You will not stumble about in darkness, walk timidly and unsure, but you will have clarity, purpose, and direction. Therefore, you have the power, the authority, to speak out a thing in your life and expect to see it manifested in the reality of your world. What you decree, you should also declare. That is to speak emphatically, make known, and clearly state your position upon the matter. In order to both decree and declare a thing and expect to see the manifestation, you must know the word of God. Amen. So you understand your legal right to have your decree upheld. You get what she's saying there? This isn't witchcraft. We don't go, I want a pot of gold. No. Amen. You must know the word of God so that you can be decreeing and declaring. Amen. There are always conditions that you must meet in order to have the authority to do anything in the kingdom of heaven. Deuteronomy 28.1, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all of his commandments, which I commanded thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. When you hear, receive, and obey the word of God, you are given the power to decree the word. Hmm. The word of God is life. It is quick, it is powerful, it is truth, it corrects, it enlightens, it heals, it delivers, and it brings visible results. It does not return without accomplishing that which it was sent to do. Read your Bible. Ask the Holy Spirit for assistance and guidance in doing it as to what you need to decree in your life on behalf of your families, ministries, city, government, and nation. And I'm going to stop there and take a little bit of a rabbit trail because I have a prayer that I've written out on my computer that I pray every day. It's not just a prayer. It's my declarations. It's my decree. And I pray over Mark. I pray over every aspect of him being a husband, a father, a businessman, a, a pastor. I pray over Jared and Lauren. I pray over each member of our staff. I pray over my health. I'm decreeing and I'm declaring. And do you know, the Lord has really burned that in my heart. Kelly, don't you, don't you go a day without your decreeing. Because decreeing and declaring changes things. Amen. Let me go back. There is a word in the word of God that holds the answers to your question. You must understand the principle behind decreeing and declaring. You must meet the condition. Read, hear, obey the word, and speak the word. Believe and expect to see the manifestation. Know that you have the right to legislate and cause change to come Amen. based on the power Amen. and dominion that God has given you. The work is done on your knees in prayer, and the Holy Spirit will reveal to you what to decree and declare. Speak the answer, not the problem. Yes. The answer is in the Word of God. Yes. Great article she wrote. 
You've been given all power and authority over the enemy according to God's word. He stated that in Luke 10, 19. When this sinks in and you begin to realize that you really do have the power to speak to that mountain and your words hold the power of life and death in conjunction with your faith, get back, Jack. <coughs> enemy, you better watch out because you'll be unstoppable. Amen. You see why he worked so hard at placing thoughts in our minds? Thoughts like, what am I going to go eat today? He didn't want you to hear it. Thoughts like, Pastor talked about this morning at the last hour. Oh, have I gone through that? Uh, you know, your bill's due at 2 o'clock and it's 1 o'clock and you're going, okay, what are we going to do? You know what we do? Our flesh gets involved and we go, okay, I'm going to have to handle this. God's not doing it. Right. Now, I don't know why he likes to wait to the last minute. I sure would like to change that about him, but he has told me no. <laughs> I'm a planner, so it's really hard for me. We must do as God says, and that is take every thought captive. That's right. The truth of the matter is, you're the victor, and we must stop believing the deception that we're the victim. Amen. Next PowerPoint. Hmm. We went really far back, huh? Or far ahead. Friends and family. Guess what? Friends and family can contribute to our attitude and our mindset. Be very careful who you confide in. <laughs> Job's friends were moved and touched by Job's calamity. In fact, they sat there seven days in silence with him. They were so moved. But they assumed that he had brought this upon himself through sin. They were wrong, and really they added more misery to what Job, Job was already going through. Sometimes friends and family mean the best, but they are the worst people to go to in the times of calamity. You need someone that is going to keep you on track. Now, we don't always want that because our flesh often doesn't like the truth. In fact, many times we want somebody to boohoo with us. How many times have you heard, I just need to bed? But you need somebody that will pray for you, love you, one that will not judge you, and someone that can tell you the truth. For me, that person is my mother. That woman does not tolerate the enemy. <laughs> and you know what I love about her? She will pick up the armor right along with me and get and jump in that battle and fight with me. Now you may not have somebody like her, and I'm here to tell you that she's available for small donations. <laughs> <laughs> show you who to confide in. You have a whole staff here. <clears throat> Ask them, whoever the Lord shows you, to be your accountability partner, your prayer partner. See, people can lead you astray quite easily because when you're in the midst of calamity is when you're at your most vulnerable. The enemy knows this and is ready and waiting to work through others to kick you when you are down. Remember, your mindset is the biggest battle you'll face. Next. Flesh. Flesh in our mindset. God's word says that we are to renew our minds. How many of you realize that he wasn't asking politely? It's a directive. Do you get that? He's not saying... Uh, you know, Danny, if you have time today, can you renew your mind? No, he didn't say that. He said, renew your mind. Amen. The enemy battles against our minds, and in conjunction, our flesh rises up against us as well. Romans 7, 16 through 18 says, But I say, walk and live habitually in the Holy Spirit, responsive to and controlled and guided by the Spirit, then you will certainly not gratify the cravings and desires of the flesh human nature without God. For the desires of the flesh, they're opposed to the Holy Spirit. And the desires of the Spirit are opposed to the flesh. Godless human nature. For these are antagonistic to each other. 
continually withstanding and in conflict with each other so that you're not free but are prevented from doing what you desire to do. For I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot perform it. I have the intention and urge to do what is right, but no power to carry it out in the flesh. That's right. Flesh is selfish. It wants to focus on me, me, me. The deceiver will come in and work in conjunction with your flesh to make you doubt, give up, focus on your circumstance. It will try to alter your mindset any way that it can. I shared this with Terry the other day. A huge revelation God gave me when it comes to my own calamities is that when I'm tired, when I'm to my limit or discouraged, I allow my flesh to completely take over. In other words, I have an adult tantrum with God. <laughs> I'm tired of this, God. You're not coming through. <laughs> and I vent it out, get it out, and it takes me a little bit of time. And, you know, uh, sometimes I call my mother. <laughs> I don't have the luxury to afford my flesh to be in control. You see, that's what God was telling me. Kelly, you're going to have to recognize when that's happening. My spirit man must be in charge. It's a continual process of making our flesh be in submission to our spirit. That's not easy. How do you accomplish that, you might ask? Well, it's through our next step. Next PowerPoint slide. Relationship. Relationship is key. Amen. What is relationship? It's key. 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 What? Key. I want you all to say it. What is relationship? Key. key. Without relationship, all you've got is religion. That's right. Many people got religion. I don't want any of that religion. Amen. I want relationship. Amen. Let's go back to the beginning, Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve had perfect spirit-to-spirit -spirit intimacy with God. Their spirits were completely in tune with God. That's how God created it to be. Until they made a decision to sin, taking away that perfect spirit-to-spirit -spirit intimacy that they had always known. We were designed to have that perfect spirit-to-spirit -spirit intimacy with God. So what does relationship look like? Well, let's use the example of a husband and wife. What is a husband and wife's relationship look like? They talk to one another. They spend time with one another. They are intimate with one another. Talk to God. Ask the Lord to reveal to you what he wants you to learn through your calamity. Do you think that there's things to be learned during a calamity? Amen. In Watchman Nee's book, Spiritual Authority, he writes about learning obedience through suffering. It is told in Hebrews 5.8 that Christ learned obedience through what he suffered. As God secured the principle of obedience through the life of our Lord, so God also established his authority through the Lord. Now let us see how God establishes today his kingdom on the basis of that authority. The Lord came to this world empty-handed. He did not bring obedience with him. He learned obedience through what he suffered and thus became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. By going through suffering after suffering, he learned to be obedient unto death, even death on a cross. When the Lord came forth from the Godhead to become man, he truly became a man, weak and acquainted with suffering. Every suffering he bore ripened into a fruit of obedience. No suffering of any kind was able to stir him to murmuring or fretfulness. How different this is. How different from this are the many Christians who fail to learn obedience even after many years. Although their suffering increases, their obedience does not. When suffering comes, they often murmur with anguish, indicating again that they have not learned obedience. 
But as our Lord passed through all kinds of suffering, he continually exhibited the spirit of obedience, and so he has become the source of our eternal salvation. By the obedience of one man, many have received grace. When we meet suffering, we then learn obedience. Oh, how true, how true. I can testify. Such obedience is real. I grasp this. Our usefulness is not determined by whether or not we have suffered, but by how much obedience we have learned through that suffering. The obedient ones alone are useful to God. Ah, oh, as long as our heart is not suffering, softened, suffering will not leave us. Our way lies in many sufferings. The easygoers and the pleasure lovers are useless before God. Let us therefore learn to obey in suffering. Now, does God make us suffer to learn obedience? No. He doesn't sit there saying, well, I think I want to teach Kelly Howell about obedience. I'm going to put her through hell for the last three years. Maybe she'll learn. Right. No. No, no. Let's hit her as hard as possible and see what she does. No. You know, God tested Job. But you know when pastor or apostle, excuse me, talks about Old Testament? That's because when Jesus Christ came, he changed the game. Yes, he did. That's right. God can and does use the things we go through to mold us if we'll allow him to. Amen. When Julia died afterwards, that's probably the worst thing I could have ever gone through. And I thought many times, you know, people might not understand that that was just an infant. It was a baby. It hadn't even been born. But that was my daughter. And I had to deliver my daughter knowing that she was not alive. That was by far the hardest thing I've ever gone through. But my heart, now, I want to be careful here because I, I don't want to give the impression that I did things right, that I was perfect. Believe me, I told God many of my thoughts like he didn't know them. I was hurt and I was angry. But I still said, Lord, what do you want to teach me? What do you want to say to me? What do you want to do? Talking to God isn't always about presenting your requests to God. Amen. You know, sometimes people think Amen. that spending time is sitting there going, Lord, I need this, I need this, Lord, I need this, Lord, I need that. No. No. When I talk to God, I'm asking him questions, I'm praising, I'm interceding, I'm speaking in tongues. Now, I want to throw in here that when it comes to spiritual warfare, which a lot of times calamity involves spiritual warfare, speaking in tongues is the best weapon against the enemy. Amen. 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 In 2005, there were some Jezebel spirits oh. operating through some people that were intent on destroying this church. It was the enemy who was intent. It was one of the most intense spiritual battles that I had been involved with up until that time. One day as I was praying, the Lord said, Kelly... Quit praying in English as the enemy hears everything you say and takes it back to their camp. Yeah. From now on, pray in tongues without ceasing until the battle is over. And that's another one that people get stuck on, without ceasing. Well, you know, obviously, I have children. I'm at home with them. I have to deal and take care of my children. I homeschool. When I'm in the shower, though, I can pray without ceasing. This is crude. When I'm in the bathroom, I can pray without ceasing. When I'm putting them to bed and it's a little bit quiet, I can pray without ceasing. You've got the time to pray without ceasing. It doesn't mean every minute of every day. That's right. It means you hold on to that. You continue. Hallelujah. That's right. It took two weeks consistently praying in tongues. Two weeks, but the battle was won. Amen. Praying in the Spirit throughout calamity is imperative. Romans 8, 26 says, So too the Holy Spirit comes to our aid and bears us up in our weakness. 
For we do not know what prayer to offer, nor how to offer it worthily as we ought, but the Spirit himself goes to meet our supplication and pleads on our behalf with unspeakable yearnings and groanings too deep for utterance. And he who searches the heart of men knows what is in the mind of the Holy Spirit, what his intent is, because the Spirit intercedes and pleads before God in behalf of the saints according to and in the harmony with God's will. Amen. Man, that's like skipping all the red tape and going straight to the source. <laughs> now, you may be sitting there thinking, well, I don't speak in tongues. <clears throat> Pastor Marion is going to be doing a, a mini workshop. Was that, I hope she got my text, Joanne, but uh, she'll be doing that September 13th. Okay. If you do not speak in tongues, I want you to schedule that right now to get there. Because everyone can. It is not something that, oh, the, the Lord has to bestow. He already did. That's right. And it just has to come up well up forth. You can speak in tongues. The enemy does not want you to, and he will keep you away from doing that. He will give you even some pastors that will say it's not, it's of the devil. Oh, no. No, 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 no. The enemy knows. The enemy knows. Next, spend time with God. Make Him your priority. Set aside a purposeful time to be with Him each day. I can't stress this enough. We must spend time with Him. Relationship is so much more than Sunday morning and Wednesday evenings. I told you guys I've been real open about it. The Lord has told me to spend an hour each day with Him. Have I done it every single day? No. Do I strive to do it? Yes. Because it's not a one-time thing. It, it's a lifestyle. It's a journey. This is all part of intimacy with God. It's a combination of worship, spending time, praying, interceding. The best part of intimacy with God is not just the peace and joy He gives, but the revelation. That is the most exciting part because without revelation, how can we move forward? I heard Jackson. <laughs> Next slide. Remember, when you're going through calamity, it's war. And do you know, I put all these points together that the Lord gave me in the, at the end, I went, war! Ah! I feel like I've been in a war these last three years. Worship gets the focus off of you and onto Him. Right. Attitude. Your attitude and mindset can alter the outcome of your calamity. Relationship. Your relationship with him will give you the support and encouragement you need to get through the calamities of this life. I want to end with a scripture that we all know, but I want you to hear it with your name in it as I read it. Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13. For I know the thoughts and plans that I have for you, Kelly, whatever your name is, says the Lord. Thoughts and plans for welfare and peace and not for evil to give you, Kelly, hope in your final outcome. Then you, Kelly, will call upon me and you, Kelly, will come and pray to me and I will hear and heed you, Kelly. Then, Kelly, you will seek me inquire for and require me as a vital necessity and find me when you, Kelly, search for me with all your heart. I read a word that God gave me a few weeks ago, but it is still up for Poach Day and I'm going to end with it. I cried last night as I read it. It was a word for me, but it was also a word to share for you. It was a word for you from the Lord. I have strategically placed you in the season that you are in right now, for there are many seasons in your lifetime. This season is not the time to groan and complain as the Israelites did, for they loved the desires of their flesh. No, it is a time to come to me, to seek me, to humble yourselves before me. And in doing so, I will reveal to you, I will grow you, I will place you precisely where you need to be. 
This requires trust. Do you trust me? For if you will trust me, seek me, and follow my plan, you will not be disappointed. Disappointment comes when you take your eyes off of me and place your trust in your own hands. I want to consume you, but only if you will allow me to. I want you. I want all of you. Amen. Amen.